everyone tuning in from around the world. This is Henrik Palmgren, a warm greeting to you all. I hope you're doing well and feeling well. We're glad that you want to spend some time with us listening and hopefully learning something new. We try to highlight many different topics from various points of view. We don't have an axe to grind and we are truly independent. Knowledge and the search for truth is our primary goal. And that's why we put the topic and the guest first so that you can form your own opinion. And if you think we're lacking a perspective, you can contact us through our website, redeyescreations.com, and drop us your guest or topic suggestion. Pierre Sabak is the author of The Murder of Reality, Hidden Symbolism of the Dragon, and he's with us here on Red Eyes Radio today to talk about snake symbolism, specifically how this have shaped words and helped to form many of the classical languages like Arabic, Semitic, Hebrew, Aramaic, Persian, Greek, Latin and even Japanese. We discuss the interconnected nature of words between these languages, the etymology and the word roots and the relationship to the reptile or the dragon, and how they, the reptiles, have manipulated humanity with words and inserted themselves as our masters. The website is pierresabak.com. Last name is spelled S-A-B-A-K, pierresabak.com. The first book, Pierre, is called The Murder of Reality. It's part of a series uh, that you're writing called Serpentigena. Tell us first a little bit about your interest in serpent symbolism and what intrigued you enough to go into the etymology of reptilians, lizards, and dragons. Uh, Right, okay. Um, I I will answer that question in a moment. Um, Just before I answer that question, though, um, is it okay if I just um, plug the wake-up call? Um, I'm going to be doing a book signing at the wake-up call. And um, if you're interested in in, um, um, listening to the researchers Neil Haig, Michael Sarion, and Lloyd Pye, um, then come along to the wake-up call. That's on the 20th of November um, in Edinburgh. Um, Right, going back to the questions of lizards and reptiles. Um, (laughs) My first introduction to this this, um, to lizards and reptiles. I mean, myself, I'd always been interested in um, ufology, um, but my first introduction was David Icke and his um, seminal book, um, the, Mur- um, the Biggest Secret. Um, and The Biggest Secret was a real eye opener for me because, for me, David Icke is um, well, he's 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 basically um he's joined together all these different strands all these different threads um between um politics the media um conspiracies ufology um and, and looked at freemasonry and the symbolism and and so it was really um all of this information which really got me intrigued about um, um about the symbolism of the dragon and um my book um took um, a lot longer to write than what i had actually anticipated um i st- it took up 7 years to write um but it, it um it took um you know i was anticipating that it was going to take um two years but it, but in actual fact it, it took um seven years to write hmm. um five years first of all to un- understand um the symbols because the symbols themselves are extremely complex um and then a further two years to edit the material together um and I'm, I'm thinking that maybe um um it might be a good place to actually look at the symbol before we actually move on to the um, um, our, the, the serpent agena, which um, is the, the Latin word for the serpent race, mm-hmm. um, and and how, then we can examine the angelic realm and the angelic lineage, and now how that interconnects to the monarchical bloodline um, in relation to the government and um, and um, institutions such as um, religion. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> so um, um, maybe we'll start with um, um, the symbols. Um, First of all, um, symbols themselves are very complex, as, as you're probably aware. And when you're dealing with the area of um, symbols, you have a whole range of, um, of um, different areas of study, which can take, could take um, a, a lifetime just to study one single area of, um, of symbols. You've got astrological symbolism. You've got geometria, which is um, using numbers in relation to words. You've got numerological symbols. Um, sacred geometry um, and etymological and word association. And um, if um, if um, if you've read my book, then you will understand that my book in particular focuses on etymology and word association. Right um, now, now the word etymology comes from um, the Greek word etymos, which means true, and it is the study of words. So this this is really the starting point is the symbol. So um, that's that's. Um, an in- introduction, um, but we can we can then 
try and pinpoint or define what a symbol actually is. So I think I could, first of all, I could give you a, the standard definition of what a symbol is, if you like the Oxford English Dictionary definition. I think and that's then always could, good as a, as a reference, a framework. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I'll give you the standard definition and then we'll move on into um, in, into my definition of what a symbol is. And obviously that's based on um, quite a number of years of, of study. Mm. So first of all, a symbol um, is a thing which conventionally is regarded as typifying, representing or recalling something, especially an idea or quality. So for example, white is the symbol of purity. Um, or the other definition of a symbol, which is um, oft often commonly cited, is a mark or character taken as the conventional sign of some object, idea, function or process, e.g. the letters standing for the chemical elements or the characters in musical notation. So um, that's the standard definition and, and they're the examples. Um, but myself, um, I give these following definitions of, of a symbol and um, this quote, these quotations are taken from my book. So a symbol is a notational motif used to denote a symbolic equivalent, particularly through the mode of homonyms, e.g. the Semitic noun Havala, a circle registers as Afar a viper. Now this is important actually because um, I argue throughout the book that most symbols actually uh, work as homonyms and uh, homonym is a word which has the same um, sound um, but, uh, but has a different meaning so for example right. the word so for example the word alter um, um, such as an altar where you would um, um, sacrifice um, is related to the word alter which is to um, ch change the altar is a vehicle of transfiguration so all the time you see um, these relationships between um, the symbol and the homonyms um, now the second definition of a, um, a, a symbol um, which I um, propose is that the purpose and application of a sign or synonym um, is to substitute the object with a symbolic counterpart. Now this is important um, because I argue that a symbol um, is used primarily um, as an object um, of um, subterfuge. Mm. In, in other words, the symbol is primarily there as the device um, to mislead people. Because um, you are always have two meanings in, in terms of the symbol. You've got the outer meaning and then you've got the inner meaning. Yeah. But primarily, symbols are there to actually mislead. So, um, um, now going back to the idea that symbols are homonyms, um, um, so going back to the idea of symbols or homonyms, if we look at the Quranic tradition, uh, the esoteric traditions of the Quran are referred to as Wuju al Quran. That literally means the forgotten recitation or the forgotten Quran. In other words, um, and, and this is the Arabic word for a homonym. So in other words, the, the Quran is written um, with homonyms and it's written in esoteric language. Mm -hmm. um, it's a book of initiation. Primarily the book, um, the Quran, is, is a book of initiation. So um, the outer meaning of the symbol would obviously be the um, literal interpretation of the Quran, um, but the inner meaning of the symbol is an esoteric meaning uh, which is aligned to the, um, um, to the angelic um, bloodline, um, which meets, our, our, um, which meets um, at, at, um, with the monarch. And, and this is an important idea which I go on um, which I talk about in my book. So um, perhaps um, before um, perhaps we before we move on um, to the angel, I can just maybe um, give you a few examples of homonyms because it's really important to understand what a homonym is and how homonyms are used are word associations. Yeah. In other words, words which 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 sound very um, similar, which um, are often um, used um, or layered um, in conjunction with the symbol. So, just um, I want to ask you, Pierre, do you, do you consider yeah. that uh, you know homonyms are are a way to uh, you know continue the deceit in one way? Because if we have it, you know, we hear sometimes that certain words should not be connected with each other. You know, although they're very very yeah. close close in their root, their etymological root is very very close. Yes. Uh, yeah. So to me, it seems like a kind of a deceit in itself to say that no, 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 don't connect these two words. But often I like to do that. How about you? Um, I totally agree, and when you start looking at the Oxford English Dictionary, um, you will often see um, that words are, are not connected where they should actually be connected. Um, and um, what I've actually found is that um, particularly the words which have very esoteric meanings, often um, the etymological root um, is non-existent in the dictionary. 
or sometimes the etymological root might be traced back via the German language, um, but the German language often is taking um, its root from the Greek or the Semitic. Right. So, so you find this commonality within all of the European languages, um, which which obviously go back to the um, classical Latin um, classical languages such as the Latin and Greek, but ultimately um, goes back to the um, Semitic, so languages such as Arabic and Hebrew. Um, but but you are right, Enric. Um, prim- primarily, um, words are purposely not connected, and this idea um, this is basically to keep us in the dark, mm. um, so we don't form these associations. Um, because words um, are very powerful; um, they control the way that we think. And, and this is another argument which I put forward in the book um, that the predator or the reptile has hijacked language. In other words, has taken um, language um, and changed it, and, and they've done this, and they've put in subliminal meanings or or words which sound similar um, are linked together subliminally in the mind and um, the reptile has done this in, in, in order to control the way that we actually think See, that, the way that's, in which we act- that's incredibly interesting to me because uh, I've always pondered that question myself in terms of how would one think if we didn't have the words to describe something? Uh, there, there must be a, a symbolic way of, yeah. of, of thinking or even an, in terms mm. of imagery and things like that. But I've discovered that mm. language is driving so much of our thought today. And that can be in many cases mm. that can be, mm. um, you know, to, to, our, to our disadvantage. Because if we, if we lack the words to describe something, mm. an emotion or whatever it might be, mm. it all goes mm. down to our vocabulary at the end. So we're limited in our thought, right? Well, um that's that's actually very true yeah i was just talking about the fact that the um, predator or the serpent has hijacked our language and in other words has hijacked the way in, in which we think um, the way in which we frame reality um, the, the way in which we actually perceive um, the external world and the way in which we actually internalize the world as well so in some respects we can argue that um, you know our, our thoughts themselves have actually been given to us um, by this external force and and this is quite an intriguing and philosophical idea um, particularly in terms of the implications as well um, so so that any anyway is, is something which um, I've um, come to realize um, through my research um, and, and and this is very much interconnected with the symbol as well mm. um, um, which works on the double or the homonym so um, I think what we're going, what what I'd like to do is give you just some examples of homonyms, and that will help um, further on in our discussion. Sure. Of it, um, obviously, for the viewers, so, um, for the listeners, so that they can um, actually um, begin to appreciate the subtlety of symbols and how they actually work. So, um, to begin with, um, Havilah circle, the Semitic word, is related to Hafer a viper and Ephah wing. So, within the Egyptian mysteries, we see that the um, um, the sun disk or the at, um, atom disk um, is typically winged um, and is combined with the cobra, which is the motif of the Theban priesthood. Um, if we've got time later on, I'd like to talk about the Theban priesthood, but mm-hmm. that's, um, um, we see there's um, other relationships as well, and, and this is another theme which I actually pick up in my work as well. Um, puns, which we find in one language, are conveyed often in many different languages, and therefore they're um, representing the same esoteric truths which are encoded in all cultures and in, and in all languages. So we see also um, within Latin, we see that there's a relationship between columba dove and columba a snake. Um, and, and that um, wordplay is, is conveyed both within the Latin and within the Arabic. Um, if I just go into um, the Japanese language, um, if I give you an example, um, if you ever go to a Japanese temple, you'll often see um, paper, and you'll see knotted paper, origami. Mm. Um, now, the word paper, kami, is a homonym of the word God. Um, the knot is a homonym of a contract. So um, the knotted paper which you find at the temples um, is symbolic of, um, of God and the contract with man. Um, and again, um, that's an example of a homonym in Japan, but these homonyms are found um, throughout all of the traditions of the mystery schools, um, whether it's the Semitic, the Chinese mystery schools, and many, many of the wordplays are found um, encoded in the world's languages. Mm. Um, this um, study of um, symbols I term as Illuminatics, um, which is really um, the study um, of, of the Illuminati um, and the signs and symbols of the Illuminati. 
So um, that's very important, understanding um, the symbol. Once you appreciate the symbol and the subtle um, nuance of the symbol, then you can actually um, start looking um, at the inner and the outer meaning found within the symbol or the parable. Um, so, for example, uh, many of the mysteries were, were conveyed in myths and parables, um, and, and typically um, the parable would use double talk. Um, um, and, and we find this within the symbols as well. The symbols, as I've argued, um, are um, devices of subterfuge. So, for example, if we look at the Virgin Mary, um, in many depictions of the Virgin Mary, you see the Virgin and she's crushing the dragon with her foot. Now, the outer meaning is obviously that, the, um, that, uh, that Mary is crushing the devil, um, which is allusion to um, Genesis 3.15, in which mm -hmm. Eve is crushing the serpent's head. Yeah. Um, obviously, the Virgin Mary is um, looking away from um, the serpent. That's the outer meaning. But the inner meaning itself is something altogether different. And, and this, again, is um, linked into the idea of um, deception. So the inner meaning, um, the Latin word vestigium, a footprint, denotes a bloodline. In English, we find the same analogous, um, analogy with a, a genetic footprint. Um, so in other words, Eve's bloodline is, is represented as mixed with the serpent. Right, mm. and her her bloodline, and indeed this is described in the Bible. Her bloodline are referred to as the children of Anak. Now, the children of Anak um, are correlated with the Nephilim, and um, um, this is a, a human angelic bloodline, which um, again um, we will try and um, discuss a little bit later on. Mm. So, um, so, that, so yeah. So, so sorry, I'll, I'll, um, that's, that's very interesting, Pierre. I, I want to ask you a little bit about in terms of what you think that this. If if we go, you know, to to a little bit more to the root of of the the creation of language, then I want to ask you how how intentional you think that these terms are, you know, and and, and the words are, and and what the origins are. Do you, do you think that this has been a hands on manipulation when it comes to some of the ancient classical languages, be it they, you know, Arabic, Aramaic, uh, Semitic, Hebrew, even Egyptian, potentially Latin, and so forth, or has this? Do you think that this has to do with an an insertion of of the creation of a, of a language at, at you know an early stage in humanity, and that has consequently uh, the, you know led huma humanity onto this path of creating their own words. But the mind mm. virus, the meme of these things, mm. were already injected at, at that point. What do you think, uh, Pierre? Uh, well, I certainly like the word mind virus, and I think that that's, this is very. Um, um, relevant terminology when we're actually looking at language. Um, I actually think that the language itself was, I think human beings, um, um, that the language of human beings was very, very different um, in, in the past and the language of um, the mammal, because again, the predator is reptilian and therefore looks at things in terms of division. So therefore, um, within particularly the classical languages now and Semitic and modern English, um, there's, there's very much um, a strong emphasis on the subject and the object. Mm. Um, but I think that that emphasis um, thousands of years ago uh, was not so strong. So I don't think that um, there was um, um, this division. And I think this division um, through words, through the subject, object, um, the use of grammar um, has been implanted um, purposely. Mm -hmm. And this is to actually um, keep us disconnected from reality because by um, reframing our reality um, through words, then what the serpent is actually doing is limiting our perception and our ability to um, to perceive um, reality in, in a way which is objective and, and also in, in a way which is also subjective as well. In other words, they're very much um, framed and um, have restricted the way in which we as human beings can think. So, you know, the question then becomes, how do we actually break out of this? Sure, sure. Um, um, it's almost like that we're actually with, within a straitjacket, and how do we um, break out of this? Do we have do we have to go as far as rewriting language? I mean, this is a, you know, this is an intellectual question. It's a philosophical question, yeah. um, but this is very very relevant because it's relevant in terms of um, that we are being controlled and manipulated through words, and and they they have this um, effect and hold over the mind. So um, I mean, this it, is the question. It's been it, it, there's been. Uh scientific studies out there which proves that uh, even our DNA actually are influenced by words, by frequencies, mm. and, and by the the subtle context of, of of words and things like this as well. So this is a you know this is a reality that that we're faced with, and, and we don't know how it would be if we didn't have this. Uh, also, in one way, we're like we're, yeah. we're trapped in the box, but we don't know how, what it looks like on the other side of that. Obviously, 
Yeah, and that's a very, that's actually a very good metaphor. Um, and and this is a, um, this is how words actually control us. And, and when we start deconstructing words, um, so for example, the word delight. I mean, um, D in English is a negation, so delight is happiness, um, but literally is not light. I mean, these all have um, subliminal effects on the way actually how we look at language, how we. Um, view what is um, happening. I also argue that there's um, that you find words which uh, repeat in many different languages and words which are similar in one language are also conveyed um, phonetically in, in ways which are very similar in other languages and I argue that these relationships um, of words which sound similar what they actually do with the subconscious mind is that they form um, subconscious associations or subliminal associations mm -hmm. and by having uh, words which sound similar but are obviously um, different phonetically then what the mind is doing is is inferring a connection so for example I will I will give you an example the word the homonym son in English is also a son as in a little boy mm -hmm. you know um, and is rel uh, and and is connected to sin because you find the connection um, between the death of the firstborn um, and, and you find that association with the word morning as well. Um, the English word morning, as in the sun rising in the morning, is also a homonym of to mourn, uh, as in death. So you see this relationship between the sun, identified with the firstborn um, sun, um, in relation to sin, um, connected to morning and um, death. And, and this is very subliminal and affects the mind. Um, but the same wordplay also works out in the Semitic as well. Right. So, uh, because so, I, so you, I just quickly, uh, Pierre, I wanted to ask you what you think about if we look at the same words from other points of, uh, from other languages as well. I mean, sin uh, is, is a name for, for the, the, the moon uh, god uh, or, or associated yes. with the moon in, in, a, in, in Semitic language, so Sumerian, you know? So. It, yeah. Is that part of of the of the whole thing as well? Do do you think that we carry multiple meanings of these words, or or many different languages? Do you think kind of uh, incorporated into our uh, cellular memory, as as it were? Well, I tend to think that these uh, word plays. Um, um, are conveyed um, and are often identical in many different languages and, and again uh, this is intentional because it's th these word plays and word associations um, are there actually um, to control us and to control us at a very subliminal level so we're not actually aware of this manipulation or control hmm. um, um, it, it, it's it's quite relevant here um, to quote a section from my book um, because what, um, I talk about um, control um, at the beginning um, of the murder of reality and, and this is um, a little quote which I think is probably quite relevant to our conversation at this point. Um, all right, language is like an encryption key. Initiation permits one to access knowledge at a security clearance level. Understanding words is a means of bypassing the guards and stealing the security card. Hmm. Okay, so... Yeah. Um, so so basically, um, you know, if we begin to break down and understand words, um, then we um, un we can then begin to decode and understand um, the signifiers and what the symbol actually means, and then we can also look at how, how the way we are actually being manipulated as well. Now, um, do you, do you think that this has been inserted there as well as as a, as a means for those people who? I guess we can use the term, you know, intelligent enough to 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 spot this or to realize this, to to try to learn this these tricks for themselves, or or, or why do you think it's open like that? Uh, like if, for for those who can find this key, to them many of this these things won't be uh, as troublesome, and and if we get yeah. savvy to them, we won't be as easily at least manipulated by them, right? Well, the key tradition has been through the mystery schools, so um, um, so obviously. Um, um, in the past, you would have had to have been initiated, yeah. um, and then you would have um, studied language, and you would have studied homonyms, and then you would have obviously gone from looking um, at the um, um, outer mysteries and, and and looked at the inner mysteries. Um, but this was often um, based on one's bloodline as well, and um, your relationship um, to the human human angelic bloodline and there is a very clear distinction between the serpent and the mammal um, which is represented in the mystery school so hair and menstrual blood is typically used to represent man or the mammal and you see that the serpent is used the serpent the dragon reptile um, bird fish these are all signifiers um, um, used to denote the fallen angelic lineage mm. um, because the um, serpent gene or the serpent race is described as um, serpentine um, it's it is uh, much more um, explicit and 
to go back to this, this is what I argue, is that the serpent itself is the architect of language. Mm. Okay? Mm. So we ourselves um, did not, um, if you like, write the script. These are, these are not our words. These words have been put into our mouth. Um, and to realize this, we have to go back into the many, many different languages. Um, but once we start looking at the different languages, and I'm going to give you some examples here, mm. um, then you can realize that the control is endemic and it is throughout every throughout all human culture. So I'm just going to have a look, first of all, um, at the Semitic and the Greek traditions, but um, I'm going to um, look at some words. So, for example, if we look at the word Nakash, a serpent, um, that is correlated um, in the Semitic with Nakash, which is to deceive. So the serpent is a deceiver. And we find this relationship also with Ifrit. Ifrit is the Arabic word for a malevolent jinn. It comes from the stem Frita, which is um, to deceive. Now, um, Frita, a deceiver, is identified um, in the Hebrew with Ifrit, spelt with a V this time, not an F, um, which is the Hebrew language. So we see that there's a close relationship between Ifrit, um, which is the Hebrew language, and Ifrit, which is a malevolent jinn or if you like, Nakash a serpent and Nahash to deceive. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and this is very much entwined also uh, within the Greek and the classical uh, mystery schools as well. So, for example, we see the wordplay with the word philosopher. Um, philosopher is a, um, a lover or a brother of wisdom. Um, philo um, means to love, but it's closely related to the word um, brother. It, it connotes a brother in this context. So, a philosopher is a brother of wisdom. And he um, is, um, is, is um, sort of identified with philo office. This is a pun or a wordplay, which is a brother of the serpent. So philosopher is a, a brother of wisdom. Philo office is a brother of the serpent. The serpent is identified with wisdom, which is primarily initiatory knowledge. Okay, mm. this knowledge is, is um, based on levels of um, of initiation, which is also based on levels of deception as well. Um, but going back, we can see that the philosopher, um, or philo office, a brother of the serpent, um, is identified in the Greek language with philology, which is the science of language, particularly historical or comparative. So instantly, we're seeing that there's a relationship, as with the Hebrew, which is um, frita, a deceiver, and ifrit, a malevolent jinn, um, with the um, philo office, uh, a a brother of the serpent, and philology, which is a science of language. Again, um, this is what I argue, is that the serpent um, as um, written or as the architect of language, um, not only this, but we also see that there's a connection with scriptural knowledge and the serpent. So in other words, the serpent um, is also um, linked um, to scriptural knowledge. Um, and they, again, as we mentioned earlier, that would you our Quran is the forgotten recitation. Um, would you um, itself is a homonym. It can also mean a facet or a face. So these are all different facets or faces of the Quran. Mm. So um, language conceals, and this is the intention, okay? And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's written in the Latin language as well. Latin, the, um, denoting the language, is connected to Latins, which is the adjective to hide or to conceal. See, um, that's really itself. interesting. That, that's because, I mean, Latin, is, is that's a created language, obviously, later mm -hmm. on, and people can see that mm -hmm. too. And that has also been the, the language of, of, you know, science in one way as well. A lot of things always got yeah. Latin names, and it's been very prominent from that sense. So that that, mm -hmm. that we can see, I think, in terms of, we have a more close relationship to Latin these days, and there we can see it. But I guess what you're arguing as well is that this took place with the more ancient uh, languages as well then, right? Um, yes, th this is going all the way back um, to um, to the beginning of language. Um, the sort of Indo-European, um, we're kind of very Eurocentric in terms of language. We do, um, um, etymologists tend to trace back all words back to the um, Sanskrit um, with, within the European etymologies. Mm. Um, but we, we mustn't forget the Chinese language, which is um, um, spoken by um, uh, millions of people. And um, my opinion is that there was a proto-language, and this language split into the Sanskrit and into the Sino or Chinese languages. Um, and then we see that there's a very close relationship between um, the two languages as well. Um, Japanese, for example, um, interplays the Arabic and Greek. So there is probably as many Arabic and Greek words in Japanese as what there are Chinese words. Wow. And indeed, we yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the Hiragana alphabet is based on a variation of the Sanskrit alphabet. Um, and 
and the uh, Japanese priest had knew this, um, and this is why they combined the kanji characters, um, which are the Chinese etymologies, um, with the hiragana and katakana alphabet, which is based on the Sanskrit alphabet, um, in, in order to combine um, to combine these words again it's very useful in terms of symbols word association and 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 in the way in which the language itself is actually written the scripts which is written mm. um so so we see that there's a close relationship to summarize between the serpent um, and talking um, identified with language and the creation of language um, but we also see that there's a strong relationship between the serpent um, imparting scriptural knowledge and this is another theme which comes out within many different languages so if for example we look at the um, um, the um, Arabic word surah which means a verse which is um, um, usually refers to a, a verse in the Quran uh, we get the word zula which is Venus Hmm. or saurus which is the greek word for a lizard okay now there's an interplay between the arabic and greek and this is actually quite common um, there's quite a close relationship often between arabic and greek words yeah. and particularly how they play out within the mystery um, religions um, but we can see um, we can see um, this idea also repeating as well so for example higher is the syrian word for a snake and is connected in the arabic to ayah a verse and ayah a sign so the serpent um, is identified with the signs um, the signs are levels of initiation identified with um, deception yeah. okay yeah. Um, so um, the ser serpent or the snake uh, which is person which is personified as the dragon or the fallen angel is a composer of scripture okay and when we start looking also within the Judaic traditions as well when we look at the Talmud we see that there are interesting um, analogies between the snake um, as a composer of scripture as well so um, and this is very, very important because often the snake can be represented as a book as well, symbolically. Um, language, uh, which is identified with learning in the serpent, um, can be um, registered or represented as the book, and the book is um, scripture. So, for example, Tabana snake um, is aligned to Tabata print, the Arabic word Tabata print, and Taban edition. Okay. Um, um, now, Tabana snake is related both to the word Taliban. Um, which literally means a student right. um, and, 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 and is connected to the Theban priesthood. So the, the scriptures of the Theban priesthood um, are basically the Judaic Talmud. This tradition actually comes from Thebes and Thebes is registered with the serpent. So the Taliban, the student, student um, is connected etymologically to Tab and a snake. Okay, because the student is initiated into the cult of the dragon, the court of the dragon. The dragon is a fallen angel and imparts the scriptures. Okay, mm. um, and again, when we go, um, when we look at the Kabbalah as well, which um, originally was the oral tradition, it's it's, it's been committed into writing now, um, but we see interesting relationships there as well. So, for example, um, Keb, which is the old Semitic word for a snake. Um, um, is, is directly um, related to Kaaba, which is a messenger. Um, Kaaba here would infer an angel, okay? It's, its literal meaning is a messenger, but the implication is of an angel because the Greek word angelos um, literally means um, a messenger. Right. So Kaaba is a messenger, Keb is a snake. Now Kebel is to receive, and Kabbalah is the oral tradition. So the oral tradition was received from a serpent or a messenger. But in addition, we can see that Kebel to receive is followed by the word Kaaba, which is to hide. So this knowledge which was received is hidden. And this is very, very important when we start looking at the Torah, the Talmud, the Quran, because these are esoteric documents. These are written in layered language. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So um, the initiate is, is given a fuller range um, of meanings in, in terms um, of, of the meaning, whereas um, the congregation would be given the literal meaning. And, and the literal meaning is all about control as well, um, whether, this, um, is to contr you know, whether this is at the political level um, or the personal or social level. Um, but th these are all facets of control. Hmm. So, um, to, to repeat this idea that the serpent is an architect of language, and this is very, very important, and it's a theme which is repeated within the Semitic language. We find it in Japanese and other languages. So, you know, I'm not just, this is not, oh, well, this is just quaint. Um, didn't the Arabs have quaint beliefs? You know, this sure. is found in the Chinese, this is found in the Japanese, and these same wordplays are repeating over and over again in many of the world's different languages. Right. Um, but, 
but going back to the Semitic, uh, we see that the word sephir, a book, um, is directly analogous to seraph, a snake, and sephir, a language. Again, the, the snake is a composer of language, is a composer of books, and the, the implication is the composer of scripture. As we said before, um, ifrit, which is a malevolent jinn, um, is analogous to ifrit, which is the Hebrew language. Okay? Mm. So, um, as an extension of this idea, then, the snake. Um, informs our academic um, institutions. Um, it, um, within the classical world, it, um, it informed the philosophical schools. Um, and in the modern world, we, we see that there's a, a very strong relationship between the serpent and knowledge. So yeah. the Greek word skolex, which means a worm, um, is connected in the Latin to scholar, which um, literally is the Latin word for a lecture school, sect our followers, um, scholar and school. As, as we said before, um, um, the scholar and Skolex a worm is, is very much analogous um, with tab and a snake and um, tab and an addition. Okay, and mm. these um, word plays, whether it's in the Greek or the Arabic, um, are continuing to repeat. Okay, so um, so um, that's basically the relationship between the serpent and language and, and um, books. Um, uh, but, yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll let you interject. Yeah, yeah, I have a few questions here in terms of. Uh, what you believe might be the the, the origin also of, of of some of these uh, some of this knowledge uh, basically in one way I, I mean for, yeah. we had Jeremy Norby with us recently here who is the author of mm. the Cosmic Serpent and and he very literally describes mm. the process of how some of the you know Amazonian uh, people got in contact with with a race of serpents basically yeah. through through you yeah. know shamanistic practices through okay. through drugs and all that. Uh, yeah. and that they actually literally gave them knowledge on how to do certain things. So if you look at it from his point of view, it's obviously yeah. a very real thing, but but it's not mm. um, it's it's not a, a a physical perhaps thing. The, the, mm. We're talking about a contact with a spirit right. world here. What what, what do you okay. think has happened here? Do you think that this is a, a physical race walking the earth, or is it more a spiritual manipulation that has taken place? Okay, it's it's a very relevant question, and the answer is. Um, Yes to both, basically. Yes, they are a physical race, and, and yes, they are uh, metaphysical as well. Um, if we look at the Syrian word higher, a serpent, is related to ayah, which means a shape, a form, or an aspect, uh, which in, th in this context would infer the materialization of a being. Okay, and we see also that there's a relationship between um, blood offerings and sacrifice and the materialization of dragons or angels or um, angelic deities. Um, um, even within the Quranic traditions themselves, um, the, the genie or the, the word jinn um, comes from the word jen, meaning a serpent. Um, often they're described as um, physical, but again, they can, um, the Arabic word jinns means a ghost as well. And this actually confuses a lot of researchers, but you must you must realize that human beings are very similar to the serpent uh, because we are physical, but yet we have a spirit. So we are able to tra um, traverse um, both the met metaphysical planes and we are able to traverse the physical planes. Mm. And the serpent itself is, is um, identical. It is both a physical being, but is also able to traverse um, the metaphysical planes. So I think that there's um, probably a very close relationship between um, the, um, the serpent um, and, and obviously um, shamanism, which is the metaphysical aspect. Um, but but um, we must also be aware that the serpent itself can uh, materialize itself into a physical form mm -hmm. and is described as a race. In, uh, again, the word serpentagina, um, gina, which is the Latin word, uh, means a race. So this is a race of beings, um, but it is connected to the spiritual realm. And the etymologist um, um, with the dragon and serpent um, is, is closely connected to the idea of the spirit. So the dragon itself is often linked to a shamanic or um, a spirit aspect which is right. very important within the traditions yeah um, so it's, it's, it's a very um, it, it's, it's a very relevant question um, but yeah the, the, these are physical beings but they're also spiritual beings as well yeah um, because that, that, um, but, that's always been interesting to me uh, you know in terms of where this where the origins of the of the knowledge uh, comes from and 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 if that has mm. been to the advantage of humanity or not because i mean now we're viewing this from another point of view if we talk about mm. you know we could talk about it in terms of progress and technology and language and industrialism and yeah. all these you know mm. s seemingly you know on the surface maybe mm. wonderful things but if mm. we look at it slightly different then we might have been mm. um, 
literally taken out of paradise, so to speak, because of this insertion of, of uh, the, the, the knowledge of, of language, in this case, then, that was given to humanity, right? Yeah, um, I, I could go along with that, yes. Um, um, yeah, the, the world is a very different place as a result of language. Um, um, the Zulus themselves talk about the fact that before um, there was language, that human beings were telepathic and that human beings were um, magical beings. And this was before the serpent came and um, injected, injected us with language. Hmm. So, um, so there is perhaps um, a lot of um, truth um, with the way in which um, language controls the way we think. And again, many of the Buddhist um, um, ideas is about actually um, going beyond the word or um, actually trying to empty the mind as well in order to um, experience um, the essence of, of reality, mm -hmm. the essence of being. So this is um, very, very important. Um, but, it, but it's um, interesting how you mention um, the fact that the um, serpent is a bringer of knowledge um, because um, not only do we see that serpent um, is a bringer of language and is connected to the scriptural traditions, um, but we do actually see um, within the etymologies themselves that the serpent is a bringer of knowledge. So um, when we look um, at the word genie, for example, um, where the word gen, a serpent, comes from, um, we see the relationship in the Semitic with the Hebrew word geoni, which means brilliant or intelligent. And geoni um, is, um, informs the English word genius. So we see that there's a close relationship. And again, when we look at the fallen angelic line, the shaitani as well, um, the shaitani is the plural word for Satan. Um, we see that the word shatter, it's, shaitan is very closely related to the word shatter, which is the Arabic word meaning wise. Um, and the, the Arabic um, etymology, shatter, informs the, the Latin root, scientia, uh, which is um, the, the Latin word for knowledge or skill in English science. So. In actual fact, the word for science, um, school, um, philosophy, um, um, office as well, because remember that the, um, our institutions are governed through offices, and the Greek word for a serpent is office. Um, how do you really? How do you, is it spelled in the same way? No, it's spelled O P H I S. But there this you is go. Yeah. Uh, this this is why we are confused, and we we can we can't actually pick out the words, and and. And, and because you're conditioned within your language, what you speak, you don't actually homonyms or words which um, sound which are the same if they're used in a different context. Sure. You don't yeah. actually pick up on that. You're not actually aware of that. You're aware of that at a subconscious level, but a conscious level, um, you've been conditioned to actually um, to use the word within a particular context. Mm. So. The serpent um, it informs language, it informs science, um, it informs um, the philosophical schools, um, and is um, seen as being clever as well. Okay, so the Latin word serpent, um, which is where we get the word serpent from, is related to the, to the word sapiens, which means intelligent. Right. That's the Latin. But the Arabic also, afa is a viper, and kafa is the Arabic word to know. The k sound in the Arabic. Um, is closely related to the h and a uh sound. So hafa um, and afa are very analogous within the Arabic language. Uh, in the Hebrew, the same relationship would be havana, understanding, and effer and asp. So the um, serpent is deemed as um, being intelligent. Okay, as yeah. we said um, earlier, the jinn also are intelligent. Um, but the idea of intelligence is found um, universally within all cultures as well. So the Zulus um, are within the African tradition. You, um, um, you have the serpent being Nyoka. Um, literally, his name means the instructor or expert. Mm. Okay, uh, the Cheetah Hori, which um, Credo Mutwa, um, the um, Zulu shaman, talks about. Mm. Um, the, the word Cheetah uh, Hori means children of the snake or children of the python. Okay, but the Cheetah Hori are also referred to as the talkers. In, in Japan, Tengu. Um, which are the serpent deities, the word Tengu actually means heaven's dog, um, but the dog is a symbol of the dog star, which um, we might get into a little bit later on if there's <laughs> time. Yeah. Um, but basically, uh, we've got Tengu, um, which is related to Tango word. So we see the relationship, whether it's in the African languages, in the Arabic languages, in the Japanese language, or in the Greek, uh, we see this um, relationship with the um, serpent as being an in instructor, an expert, an initiator. Um, now, is, is that, do you think, subliminal 
programming in that sense by inserting themselves, their own, uh, you, you know, relating yeah. to themselves in that way. Because I, I would figure as well then that these words wouldn't carry the negative, perhaps because of you know religious, uh, the, the religious context. Yeah. Serpent wouldn't carry that negative connotation that it might do mm. today, right? At that point. Well, it's 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 very interesting that you actually um, bring this idea up um, because um, I'd never really looked at it before um, that the serpent was. Um, um, putting in positive um, connotations or, or words associated with the serpent in mm. order to program human beings. Right. Um, but I think that that's actually a very clever response. And I think, Henrik, um, you've actually um, hit the nail on the head there. This is very, very true. Um, and, and it goes back to the idea of um, human beings um, being programmed through language. Right. And that the serpent is an architect of language and is therefore the architect of this control. Okay, and the architect is a very prominent symbol um, of of the mason or, or the Freemason, uh, of Freemasonry as well. Um, the builder is a symbol of the angel, and and that's something we'll talk about a little bit later on. Mm. Um, but the, the, um, so we, we've talked particularly about relationship between serpents um, and intelligence, but we also see this: um, the serpent is a symbol of the angel. And we can see this um, reference with intelligence in relation to the angelic lineage as well. Yeah. So Malak and Angel is a pun on mock brains. In the old Semitic, Baal, uh, which um, literally means Lord, uh, but sometimes he was depicted as a serpent deity, is connected to Baal, the mind. So the angel is represented as a snake, right? It's also a symbol of duplicity and a conveyor of knowledge, right? In particular, this knowledge is concealed through words, and this is a very important um, point which needs to be emphasized. Um, I argued before that this knowledge was concealed through, um, in the Arabic traditions, would you al Quran, the forgotten recitation. Um, um, now, the angel, in addition, um, is connected with Venus, which, um, in which the Latin word Venus is Lucifer as well. Mm. Um, so, um, if we look within the Egyptian mysteries, we see the crocodile god. Okay, the crocodile is a symbol of the the dragon. So, the word Sobek, which is the crocodile god, um, is punned with Sabak, which means a lesson or lecture, and Sabaka, which is the morning star. Okay, now the morning star, um, as I mentioned earlier, is pictured in Judaic law as the angel um, Lucifer. That's right. Okay, so the Luc Lucifer, in the, in the Latin, Lucifer is Luxfer, the light bringer. Okay, uh, now etymologists often trace Lucifer to Luxfer, the light bringer, but in actual fact, um, the Latin word Lucifer um, is going back to the Semitic because Lucifer is really from the um, Semitic root Lucifer, which is the Hebrew verbal stem to tell. Okay, mm. um, and um, again, this is because Lucifer is an angel. Angelos is a messenger, mm. um, the Greek word where the word angel comes from. Okay, um, and, and as I've said before, Lucifer is often depicted as a serpent or a seraph, and the seraph interconnects with Sephir, a book, and Sapphir language. Okay, mm. um, and and. We, we, to summarize, basically, you know, we, we can say that this connects to the Ifrit, connects to Ifrit's language, um, of the philosophers, or Philo Office, the brother of the serpent, or even, if you like, um, the scholars um, who were identified with Skolex or Worm. Um, these are all um, personifications of the dragon, um, which are deemed as um, the, the fallen angels, basically. Yeah. So, um, and, and the angels, an, an extension of the idea of um, of, of an angel who conveys knowledge is the idea of the angel as a talker and the talker itself is interlinked um, with the king as well. So th this is perhaps an area we could look uh, look into next. I, I, um, I was going to re-emphasize that point in terms of the, the, the snake or, or serpents being related to you know, intelligence as well, or, or wisdom, and even uh, mm. Jesus said, be wise as serpents, right? There's a, mm. a potentially mm. a knowledge about that uh, at that point as well, that, uh, that these are associated with with wisdom and 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 I guess uh, again the, mm. the question is, do they do this? The, is that the the mm. conscious insertion to to uh, you know to consider them that they consider themselves to be wise, or is it that humanity do you think really you know looked up to these uh, this race as well and, and said oh you know these are these are wise mm. and intelligent uh, beings and, mm. and and therefore we venerated them as as, as gods or, or how do you think mm. that came about? Well, I. <laughs> Because the puns are repeating over and over again in the many different languages, I tend to think that um, that the words themselves are insertions, and that these insertions um, come from the angels themselves. And right. The idea was to actually control. Um, 
I, I do think, though, in, in some respects, um, that the human is actually very different to the angel. And, and this makes me wonder whether this is at um, a psychic level as well, um, because um, the human is uh, very much um, identified or linked with the priesthood. And um, this seems to be levels of, of knowledge. And it seems that the serpent also um, utilized this energy, which is very intrinsic to the human being. And that there's something which the serpent needs um, from the human being. So I, I think that this is very relevant. And, and the level of manipulation is about the exploitation of the human being. Um, and it's quite interesting. If, if we look at the word Yahweh um, coming from the word to be, um, the, the Semitic word um, Haya, to be, is connected to the Syrian word Haya, a serpent. So Yahweh is a serpent deity. Mm. Um, mm. Now, we talk about a human being, but so human being, God is defined as being. He uh, comes from, from the verbal root I, um, I am. Um, but, but also we are beings as well. So in some respects, um, particularly within the Gnostic traditions, the human being um, is described as um, godlike. And we can also see this idea also conveyed within the Luciferic traditions as well, um, and even within Satanism as well, that the um, human being takes on um, this godlike status. Right. Uh, um, and within Buddhism as well, that the human being is... Um, a manifestation or a materialization on, of God or that God expresses himself, herself um, through his creation. You know, these are all sort of abstract ideas. Yeah. Um, but um, going back to the idea of um, the angel um, right. as, as a messenger or a talker, um, the, the word, um, the, the Greek word angelos, um, which, which means a messenger, um, is a translation um, from the Hebrew word malak. Now, the, esoterically, malak means a shining king or a shining snake. Um, but rabbinical scholars trace the root to the um, Arabic root amar, which is to speak or to command. Okay, yeah. and so we see that there's a relationship um, with the angel and talking. In addition, we can see that there's um, a philological connection between the word malak and melek, which is a king. So both the angel and the king is um, is identified with talking. Okay, yeah. and 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 this idea is is conveyed within the Syrian and Arabic. So hacker to talk um, is connected to hakim, which is the Arabic word for a king, king that's um, right. and the Babylon, and the Babylonian word akan a snake. So we see here that there's a relationship between the snake, the king, and talking. Um, so, um, and so, and, and this is um, important because um, talking is also it's established with um, the talking is is, is connected to um, the religious law, but it's also correlated um, to the laws of the land and to parliament as well. So the English word um, parliament comes from the French root parler to speak. Okay, and his um, parler is related to the Sanskrit root pala, um, a king. Okay, hmm. in the Semitic languages, um, pala is rendered as para, which is um, a pharaoh. Okay, right. and these etymologies in the Akkadian language, um, which is the old Semitic, um, in interface with pr, which is the Akkadian word for a snake. Okay, in the Persian, um, the pr is rendered as peri, which is the the serpent race. Okay, now the serpent race um, are identified in Thebes with the serpentagena. Um, they are known as the Tabani or the Anguagena in the Latin. Okay, the, the homonym Anguagena, it's a homonym in the Latin. Anguagena means a Theban or it literally means the serpent race. Mm. Um, but th and this is um, connected to the Theban priesthood. Um, but going back, um, the snake is a personification of the dragon or angel. Okay, and, and is very much connected um, to talking, okay, mm. connected to scriptural knowledge um, and the interface um, with um, government and with religion, okay. Um, now, the angel is also um, connected um, to um, the boat as well and the symbol of the boat um, because the Hebrew word malak, an angel, is a homonym of the word malak, a sailor. So the angel is deemed as a sailor. Okay, we find this also within Latin as well. Um, the Latin word host, which which literally means army, sometimes it gets translated as multitude, mm -hmm. um, is from the um, Hebrew word seboeth, uh, which means um, a crew member of a naval vessel or an itinerant of a naval vessel. Okay, and that root seboeth, uh, which which in the Latin is the host or the angelic host, um, comes from the root sevet, which means crew. So an angel is deemed as a crew member, and the boat is an important symbol um, of the angel. 
And right. it is in, in addition, the boat is also connected to worship. If we look at the word worship, were ship, yeah. okay? In the old English, were than Skype, uh, which means were the ship. Skype is from the Greek group. Um, I think it's, um, it's from the Greek word meaning a boat anyway. Um, so we, we see that the boat is an emblem of the angelic host and is associated with scriptural knowledge. Um, and it's symmetrical with the formation of the law and governance. Okay, and that's very important. So I'm, I'm just going to give you um, just a list of a few words just um, so that you can get um, a feel for this as well. Right. So how the boat is a symbol of the angelic host. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Arabic, we, we have the word safina, which is the Arabic word for a ship, boat or vessel. Okay. In addition, safina is the Arabic word for a blank book. Okay. That same wordplay is found in the Greek. A biblos a book is identified with biblos, a type of boat. Okay, and Biblos is where we get the word Bible from. Okay, it's right. also identified with Bibia to drink, which is a symbol of the communion. And we can see how these symbols are, are layered, um, are layered, um, and, and very nuanced. And, and this word association and this lateral way of thinking is very, very important when we come come to um, interpreting symbols. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it's very important not to be very fixed and very rigid. In in the way that we're very fixed and rigid, you, we will often say, you have to spell a word like this, not like that. But we've been conditioned to be rigid. Yeah. And this rigidity stops us from being able to see the truth hmm. um, to actually to interpret the inner meaning within the symbols or the inner meaning within the words because we be, we, we become too blind the word may may be may sound phonetically the same but if it's spelt different we can't see it we're blind to it as right. what i said before how many greek scholars who see the word office connect the word office serpent um, with um, office but the office um, comes from the word opus, which is to work, um, and work here is identified with a serpent, which would be the initiant, um, and, and connected to offer, which is an offering. So this would be um, identified with worship. Hmm. Um, but anyway, um, this is how we're kept in the dark um, through the use um, of words and, um, and and through um, spelling as well, so that that's, we don't actually form these connections. Well, that's really uh, that's really the the tip of it. If if it all is magic in that sense, then it can't be more clear than the fact that we spell the words. It's a spell that has been put on us, and <laughs> and we have to well, break free of that spell, obviously, in that sense. I think Pierre, that this would be a good place as well to to uh, begin to run things up here for our first hour. And uh, yep. obviously I want to mention your book title again, uh, The Murder mm. of Reality, Hidden Symbolism of the Dragon. And I've been going through uh, a lot of pages in your book. I've been going through some of these connections that you've been talking about. And, and it's just the entire book is filled with these uh, the etymological connections uh, mm. in, in different ways to different languages and, and shows... Uh, it, it kind of demonstrates the 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 idea, obviously, very very well in terms of how the interconnectedness is between different mm. languages, and also how uh, it kind of takes you on a whole, uh, yeah. you know, a route as it were through uh, history, but looking at at at, the, at the, it from a point of view of of words. And I really really yeah. enjoy the book, uh, and I think it's really well made, and I think it will unlock. Uh, some aspect to how we think about and relate to words, uh, you know, and, and and again, just to see the connections, so many connections to to the serpent is just uh, it's just incredible. And uh, Pierre, uh, mm -hmm. the best way, obviously, I guess, for people to to get a copy of the book if they're interested is mm -hmm. to go to to your website. Uh, tell us a little right. bit more about uh, the site and how people can uh, can get to it. Okay, um, if you go to www. Pierre Sabak, Sabak is spelled S A B A K. Um, just um, follow the links, um, and, and that will take you um, to, to um, the bookshop, to um, um, David Ike's bookshop, and, and he's actually the sole distributor of um, my book. So um, the only place where you can actually get a copy is through David Ike's um, website. Um, but if you please, go, if you go through my website. Um, um, that would be great because obviously I'm looking for um, traffic on my website. Um, so www.psabac.com um, and you can um, purchase a book um, from, um, from from my site basically. Excellent. Yeah. And there's a lot of other editions too on the site. Check that out. There's some art galleries, some of uh, Pierre's uh, mm. wonderful art there as well. So uh, do take a look. There's a lot of stuff there for you. Again, Pierre Sabak, that's spelled S-A-B-A-K.com. Uh, mm. 
And I'm also, in addition, I'm also trying to um, place um, some articles um, on my website as well, um, maybe one every two or three weeks. So, you know, keep on coming back to the website because there's always new material which I'm trying to put on and, and update continually. Um, so please, you know, check out the website. And uh, again, just to mention, uh, you'll be at the, the wake-up call uh, for some book signings as well here. This is in Scotland. Uh, and yes. if, if people want to have more information about that and check out some of the speakers and all that as well, uh, go to the wake up call, uh, dot org, uh, dot uk. And when when was this again? Remind us when when the date of this was. Um, it's um, 20th of November and it's in Edinburgh. So um, just um, go to the website and that will give you all the details which you need in order to um, purchase tickets. Um, and um, yeah, this is my first um, book signing, so um, that should be interesting because um, I don't normally uh, do book signings as David Icke is the sole distributor of um, of my books, um, but this is a, a, a one-off. So, um, so yeah, Excellent. come along and it'll be interesting to talk to everyone. All right, very good. Uh, stay with us, Pierre. Uh, we'll continue to talk about many other things that we haven't gotten to yet. coming up stay with us as we continue to talk about Pierre's research in our second hour for Red Eyes members. Pierre connects the word roots from the angelic bloodlines to royal bloodlines and fraternal organizations like Freemasonry and the Order of the Seraphim. The words are interlinked and Pierre shows how the Bible, law, maritime law, government is connected to the serpent. We discuss leaders, Caesar, Starman and modern politicians use of deceptive words to spell bind people. We discuss the Theban priesthood, Oannes, the fish people, and even the abduction phenomena and the grace. I also ask Pierre how he does his research, if he ever gets lost in it all, and if finding the language keys are difficult. It's another way of thinking about words and rethinking the way words might have come about. Question the roots of it all, that's never a bad thing. We take way too much for granted. 
So don't miss the second hour. All information on how you can get access to our members area can be found on our website, redicecreations.com. A three month subscription is 15 euros. That's just five euros per month. And you'll get full access to our entire members area. It's safe, it's easy, and you'll get instant access. So thank you for supporting independent and commercial free radio.